Next up is uh, Hoss Beliadi. Unfortunately, Hoss is not able to be with us, but we have a recorded session. Uh, he's a data scientist engineer with wine, oil, and gas, uh, and also a founder and CEO of Officer Intelligence LCT. He has uh, multiple experience from the oil and gas business and uh, more than 10 years experience working various conventional and unconventional restaurants around the world. Uh, he is also a primary author of uh, hydraulic fracturing in unconventional reservoirs and the author and the key reason for talking here today is that he is the author of a machine learning guide for oil and gas using pipe. So I will kick off uh, Hoss's presentation and enjoy. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, well, thanks everybody for tuning in today. My name is Hoss Bill Yadi, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the applications of um, some of the machine learning applications uh, in the oil and gas using Python. So before getting started, I'm gonna start off with like some basic uh, concepts and then I'm gonna dive into the workflow and finally a case study um, in Haynesville. So first off, uh, I'd just like to spend maybe 30 seconds defining terminologies here. So what is artificial intelligence? So AI is basically using um, machine intelligence as opposed to using human intelligence. Um, uh, and then machine learning is considered to be a subset of AI, as you can see from this slide here. And, and um, so basically in machine learning, we're giving the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, uh, which is pretty powerful. So basically um, training somebody how to play basketball, that is considered machine learning, right? Um, so, so, um, so machine learning is not the same as AI, it's a subset of AI, and basically uh, using the computer's ability to learn without explicitly uh, programming. Uh, and then, then deep learning, finally, that you hear a lot about, like a lot of companies use, um, especially in, 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 the tech, um, in the tech industry, uh, is a subset of machine learning. Uh, so deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And basically, in deep learning, we use um, an artificial neural network with um, multiple layers. Uh, and, and examples of, of deep learning are, like, for example, the convolutional neural network, which are used for uh, different purposes, like especially in the oil and gas industry, um, uh, such as uh, seismic interpretation. Uh, we also have the recurrent neural network, RNNs. Uh, these are used for time series forecasting. Uh, which has a lot of applications actually in the oil and gas industry, especially uh, using the uh, long short-term memory, uh, like LSTM models. Uh, so today, I want to hone in on machine learning itself. I want to talk about um, like a practical workflow uh, to use uh, different machine learning algorithms uh, to find patterns and, and insight from the data. So my topic today will focus on machine learning. So before um, Getting more into the workflow, I want to talk about different machine learning types. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware that we have supervised, we have unsupervised, and we have semi-supervised and reinforcement learning. So in, in, in supervised machine learning, we're talking about having um, a data set that is labeled or, or, or has an output associated with that, with that data set. So if you have a bunch of input features and you're trying to um, um, correlate those input features to an output, uh, to one single output or multiple outputs uh, in, in, in which your data is, is, is labeled. It is called supervised, which I think we've seen some examples um, in, in today's like workshop. Um, the unsupervised is uh, basically trying to cluster data. If you have a large data set and you're trying to uh, cluster the data into different clusters, um, you can use different unsupervised techniques such as k-means clustering and, and you know, the uh, hierarchical clustering and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then sometimes you can use unsupervised to cluster the data and then use the output of the unsupervised model, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the, the output of the unsupervised model as the output of your uh, supervised model uh, and, and basically call that a semi-supervised. So you basically cluster the data and let's just say you cluster the data into three clusters cluster one, two, and three, 
and then you use that um, uh, like output column as the um, or that clustering column as the output into your supervised model, which is called the semi-supervised and reinforcement learning, which is, uh, to be honest, in, in the oil and gas industry, I haven't seen many publications on reinforcement. It's, it's pretty new uh, in the oil and gas, but I think it has a lot of, like it could have some applications in the oil and gas. Um, uh, in reinforcement learning, the machine continuously trains itself um, on, on a continual basis and basically this is one of the powerful like algorithms behind uh, some of the self-driving cars that we see today. Uh, so I think uh, what you could also combine reinforcement learning with deep learning. You can call it deep reinforcement learning. So, so I think um, over the next few years, we're going to probably hear more from um, like, like, like uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, but I, so today I'm going to talk about a, a, you know, building supervised machine learning models. Uh, and I'll show you a case study on that. So some of the examples on uh, some of the uh, well-known algorithms within supervised, you know, ANN is, is, is probably, you guys have probably all heard of that before. We have support vector machine, we have k-nearest neighbor, random forest, all, all kinds of you know, decision tree algorithm or tree-based algorithms. Uh, we, we, have, we have gradient uh, uh, boosting, we have adaptive gradient boosting. Uh, each one of these algorithms have uh, like certain applications, and depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, some of these algorithms uh, could provide a, a, a more accurate result as compared to others. On the unsupervised, as I said, we have, you know, K-means clustering is probably uh, used extensively in the oil and gas industry, uh, especially for, you know, phases classification that we saw today. Uh, the hierarchical clustering is another one. Um, DB scan, uh, density-based um, um, Clustering technique is also pretty powerful, uh, like especially if we're not sure how many uh, clusters to choose, you can use DBS scan. And on the reinforcement learning side, we have Markov decision process and Q learning. Uh, so to, today I want to talk about you know ANN and support vector machine a little bit, and, and show you a case study um, uh, how we used um, uh, these two techniques to uh, drive and, and kind of uh, get insights from our completion data set. Before going into that, I want to talk about the workflow. So first, the, like the first step in any machine learning um, um, like model or before building a machine learning model is to collect and like that data. And as a lot of the presenters mentioned today, you know, a lot of the companies have started to develop, you know, data warehouses, you know, so as opposed to just having everything in Excel and having like the data in different sources, we can have one central uh, data warehouse that could be a SQL data warehouse or you know or, or SQL cloud data warehouse that, that you can tap into and get that information. So at Vine, we've done a pretty good job. I think we have a, a SQL data warehouse, uh, on-prem SQL data warehouse that uh, stores uh, pretty much everything that we have from drilling, from, from from geology to drilling to completions to reservoir to production. We have it all in our SQL data warehouse, and and we can pull data easily. And basically pull the data into, you know, a, a visualization dashboard such as Spotfire and visualize it. Uh, and then, so th this is step number one. Step number two is, is you know, cleaning that data. So, um, th you know, spending some time to understanding what's behind the data and cleaning that data is very important, especially if um, you have some anomalous points, you have points that are, um, are, are considered like erroneous and, and, and are inaccurate. We, Pretty much have to remove those points or evaluate the validity of those points prior to proceeding to the next step. So, so collecting and cleaning that data, and then uh, one of the steps in in, in data cleaning or or, or uh, is, is data visualization. So you can see here that in, in, like in the first like few steps, we have to visualize the data. So by visualizing the data, I'm talking about just you know showing just uh, using various Python libraries for data visualization. Uh, for anomaly detection, um, you know, like, 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 for example, if I'm evaluating a completions data set, you know, if I, if I have a, a point that says, you know, you've pumped uh, 10,000 pounds per foot of propent, you know, is that accurate? Well, probably not accurate, right? So we need to remove that or, or, or question the validity of that point prior to moving to the next step. So simple plots like distribution plots or box plots or just simply like scatter plots, you know, like, 
uh, using the Seaborn library, you can really um, identify a lot of these, 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 these anomalous points that we could potentially remove prior to proceeding to the next step. Another important step is collinearity removal. Um, I'll show you guys an example is, it's pretty important to remove parameters that are collinear. They provide the same information. For example, in, in, in the completions ward, you know, at the, you know, the sand per foot and water per foot, like usually the more sand per foot you pump, uh, you also pump more water per foot. So if you plot those, those two parameters on a scatter plot, you can see a high collinearity. Uh, so when the Pearson correlation coefficient or even Spearman correlation coefficient is, is high, um, usually more than 90%, you can remove one because um, including both into your model um, could, could just confuse your model even more. So, so it is important to remove those collinear features. And then uh, feature ranking and, and selection, I think uh, we've had some conversations on that today. Uh, that's a pretty important piece where you use different types of you know, tree-based algorithms. You can use you know, you can use decision trees, random forest, gradient boosting, extra trees. Uh, you can use, you know, I would say like six, seven different techniques that you can use to feature, uh, to do feature ranking on your parameters. So, so feature ranking is, is the next important thing that we got to do to understand which features have the highest impact on the, the output of the model. So, so the features that fall at the bottom of the tree, which I'll show you in a minute, those features can be removed from your analysis and not included because you don't need them anymore. And then prior to actually going into applying machine learning, like one important step, especially if you're using uh, some of the algorithms such as artificial neural network or uh, support vector machine, uh, when using those algorithms, uh, th those algorithms, it is pretty important to normalize a data set. Um, and by normalization, I'm talking about taking each, you know, uh, input feature and uh, subtracting the min, uh, dividing it by the max minus the min, and that, that's feature normalization. Or, or some other algorithms, such as tree-based algorithms, such as random forest, extra trees, do not require any nor neither normalization nor standardization. And, and, and some others, such as you know, unsupervised learning algorithms, k-means clustering, uh, th th those are recommended uh, to use standardization as opposed to normalization, in which you take each input feature, you subtract out the mean and then divide it by standard deviation. So going back to the workflow section, so we talked about you know, uh, collecting data, cleaning data, and then normalizing or standardizing the data, right? So now, once you have all that information ready to go, the next step is to find out which, you know, what type of model to use. And the type of model to use is, is really a function of um, um, what kind of problem you're trying to solve, how much data you have. And, and, and in the, like in those cases, you can try different models to see which one provides the highest accuracy. So uh, in, in, in this case, we do a cross-validation. And cross-validation is just a process of you know, uh, splitting your data into um, a, a, a training and testing set. So let's just say you feed in your model, 70% um, of the data is fed into your model as training, and then, uh, you tr and then you train the model based on 70% of the data, and then you, you test it on the remaining 30% of the data. Uh, to see how your model like performs. And if that's good, you can also do one final validation, which is called blind set validation. And in that case, you just simply feed in the model a data set that has, that has never been seen before and see how it performs in that blind data set. And then if it does well in the blind data set, then you are pretty much in a, in a good shape to go and you can go to the next state, uh, the, the next phase, which is um, deploying the model. So these are some of the applications uh, in the oil and gas. You have completions and wall spacing optimization. You have type curve clustering using unsupervised learning techniques. Later penetration drilling optimization uh, is pretty powerful. You can use different um, uh, machine learning models to, to, to uh, optimize uh, the rate of penetration during drilling. Um, and you can actually couple that with other optimization algorithms such as genetic algorithm and particle swarm optimization to really find the best parameters that optimizes your, that maximizes your ROP. And, and then uh, number four is, is predictive maintenance. Uh, you probably hear a lot about those. Liquid loading detection. Uh, this is another powerful uh, technique to use unsupervised learning uh, methodologies to uh, find when a well is loaded and actually deploy that model real time to help you make real-time decisions. 
and, we'll, and, and we're talking about you know deploying these models on, on an edge device so you can uh, make real-time decision to uh, create value for a lot of the companies. Uh, plunger lip and imminent optimization. This is another powerful technique or is another like powerful uh, project that you can use uh, machine learning on. Uh, fall detection through seismic data, geomechanical log prediction. These are pretty simple ones actually, like, ge like geomechanical log prediction, especially predicting uh, shear and compression wave travel times and, and using those to uh, calculate Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, closure pressure, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are actually uh, pretty you know, powerful ways of, of really being able to predict uh, logs in areas that you don't have. And then phases classification, I think uh, people talked about that. And then uh, frac chemical optimization this is another area that has a lot of potential uh, petrophysical and geomechanical properties. And then surface shooting pressure uh, prediction using um, deep learning in this case, uh, long short-term memory. Um, so these are some, like some of the applications, some of the uh, Python libraries that I've used for this uh, project here. Uh, and are pretty well known. Uh, NumPy is a fundamental uh, package for, uh, for for scientific computing in Python. It's basically the linear algebra library. Uh, like in Python, pandas, you, get, you guys have all like heard of that before. It's built on top of NumPy and, and people regard pandas as the Python's version of Excel. Uh, so so uh, matplotlib is a very popular uh, visualization library in Python. It, it, you, you can really do all kinds of plots in matplotlib. It's not as uh, nice looking as Seaborn, um, but but it, it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of adjusting your figures uh, as, as as opposed to Seaborn, which is very powerful. It's actually one of my favorite libraries, but uh, you have you have some limitations with Seaborn. And then um, some of the um, uh, platforms that I saw today, it looks like they were uh, built on top of Plotly. So Plotly is actually an interactive, it's an open source interactive visualization library, very powerful, highly recommended. Um, and actually uh, coupling Plotly with Dash, you know, you can create dashboards, you know, using just Plotly and Dash. Uh, if you don't want to use Spotfire or, or, or Power BI and just want to, you know, create your own, own kind of dashboards, you can couple Plotly and Dash and, and basically, uh, the, the combination of two are pretty powerful uh, tools to uh, create very inter nice interactive dashboards. And then Scikit-Learn is, is basically like, um, as you guys know, is a machine learning library used for all kinds of you know, um, uh, problem solving, such as classification, regression, and clustering problems. Um, and also pretty much you know, all of these, a, a lot of the algorithms that I showed you in, in uh, uh, like a few slides ago, those are all can be found within Scikit-Learn. So, uh, you know, uh, building a, a machine learning model with, with Scikit-Learn is, is fairly simple and straightforward. And they've done a pretty good job uh, updating those libraries and really keeping up with the latest and greatest technologies. And TensorFlow is, you guys, uh, I think we've had some, some talks about those. This is also a, a powerful deep learning library that you can use for um, using like for example, uh, the CNN or, or, or you know, uh, solving problems such, such as the, you know, using LSTM to, to uh, uh, predict uh, the, the, the frac treating pressure, or gas pricing and other problems. So this is, a, this is like an example. So th these are from a, you know, Hainesville case study. We have a bunch of input features on the left-hand side. You have a hidden layer, uh, one hidden layer in the middle and you have an output. So we're trying to basically understand the relationship between you know, cluster spacing, um, stage, you know, stage spacing, um, amper foot, sand to water ratio, average shooting rate, and so many of those geologic features to uh, the productivity, which in this case we're, we're defining product, the, the productivity as EUR per thousand feet. So, uh, so we so we built two different models. We built an ANN model, and also we built a support vector machine model uh, to understand uh, what is the impact of each feature on the uh, production performance, which is in this case defined as EUR per thousand feet. So this is actually a pretty simple model. We can actually be more creative with this and say, okay, instead of one output, we can have multiple outputs. We could have, you know, QM uh, 30 per foot, QM uh, 60 per foot. Cube 90, all the way to cube two years per foot, you know, uh, that would actually uh, be a multi-output machine learning model then. But in this case, this is a basic model that we built. 
trying to understand the relationship between you know all the input features and output feature and and a and n is, is actually a pretty straightforward like the basic fundamentals of a and n is is that you have an input you multiply it by uh by a uh, by 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 the weights of these uh of, of these neurons uh, and then you, you apply an activation function and then you add a bias then you get your output and basically like what you do in this case is uh, once you get your output, the objective in an a n model is to minimize to minimize a loss function. And, and that loss function is simply defined as the difference between your uh, predicted value minus your actual value. So, for example, if uh, on the first iteration, uh, my EUR per thousand feet turns out to be 2 BCF per thousand feet and the actual was 1.5, what the model does, it goes back, it, it back propagates into this hidden layer and it changes the weights of these neurons um, and basically um, updates those weights and runs it again. And basically now you have a new um, EUR per thousand feet. Let's just say it's EUR per thousand feet is now 1.8 BCF and the actual is still 1.5. It keeps iterating through those epochs until, until that um, uh, objective function of minimizing um, um, you know, the loss function is, is, is converged or, or reached. So that's how a, a basic neural network works. It's pretty actually simple, uh, but, but it's very powerful, and like especially as you get a lot more data. So in, in the past, um, you know, uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs in AI has been in, 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 in deep learning. Uh, and the reason for that is because you have, the amount of data has, has, has increased tremendously. You have, uh, uh, you know, GPU uh, capabilities now. You have graphics uh, 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 user processing now, um, and, and also um, you have toolboxes such as TensorFlow. You know, they can you can deploy these models uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, so, so uh, what we've seen, like in like, you know, I think in the past like ten or twenty years, like uh, the biggest like breakthrough in AI has been deep learning, and because like in the past, you know, you would not, you did not used to get good results, but now with the amounts of data um, um, that, 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 has, that has increased tremendously, you have a, a, a lot of potential from, from just deep learning itself. Now, uh, I talked about the collinearity removal. This is just simply showing you the, all the parameters, uh, cluster spacing, stage spacing versus, uh, you know, the other parameters. Uh, so, so this is used to find features that had high collinearity, uh, that have a high Pearson correlation coefficient. And Pearson correlation coefficient is defined as the covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviation of x times standard deviation of y. So, uh, as, as I said, like in this case, we removed stage spacing and we also removed water per foot because stage spacing was heavily collinear with cluster spacing and water per foot was heavily collinear with stand per foot. So we removed those two features and we used the rest of the features and, and basically built a uh, like proceeded to the next step. So this is just a, you know, a simple, um, you know, one line of code uh, using the Seaborne library, sns.heatmap to, to kind of provide you this, this, this heat map of, you know, what is the relationship between different features in, in order to be able to remove collinear features. Next is uh, feature selection, uh, feature ranking, and model selection, and grid search. So uh, we use, as I said, there are different uh, algorithms that you can use for feature ranking. Uh, some of the most uh, well-known algorithms that uh, a lot of data scientists use uh, are called random forest. Uh, you can use extra trees. You can use gradient boosting. You can use cat boosting. Uh, there, there are like all of those algorithms should give you similar ranking. They're not going to be the same. They're not going to have the same exact, um, you know, uh, coefficients, but um, they will give you, they should give you um, uh, some type of a, a, a feature ranking to kind of like for you to identify which features fall at the top of the tree and which features fall at the bottom of the tree. So, so random forest is a powerful one. It's basically a combination of, um, uh, it's, it's an ensemble of decision trees as opposed to using one decision tree. You use, you can use thousands. You can actually specify how many trees you can use, like in your model, the number of trees within the, within, within the scikit learn. So, so by defining more trees to use, it usually helps you with, with being more accurate on, on, on your prediction. Uh, so random forest is pretty popular. So 
we use random forest to understand what is the importance of each of these completions features on the output feature, which you, which if you recall, it was EUR per thousand feet. As you can as you can see here, you have sand per foot and cluster spacing falling at the top of the tree, followed by sand to water ratio and some of the geologic features. So this is again, it is in a, in a particular area in, in Haynesville. This is not um, um, the case in, in the entire Haynesville, or this is just one subsample of a, of a large data set that, 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 like, that I picked for this, for, for this case study. Uh, but it gives you a lot of indication as far as what parameters to hone in on. You know, it, it tells you that, you know, you got to hone in on sand per foot. You got to hone in on uh, cluster spacing. Cluster spacing. And, and some so next, uh, support vector machine. So I'm almost done. So I'm just going to go through what support vector machine is and then go through some of the results. So in support vector machine, basically what we're doing is uh, we're trying to maximize um, the margin uh, between um, these these support vectors. So as you can see here, you, you have a classification problem here. You have the red dots and the green dots. And the idea is to maximize um, the margin uh, through, through a separating hyperplane. So we're trying to draw this hyperplane, this black hyperplane, in a manner that would maximize the distance from these closest uh, circles, green and red circles, to this. So if, if, I, if I drew this, this way, it probably would not maximize it on both sides. It would probably maximize it on one side. So we're trying to draw it in a manner that would maximize the distance between uh, these support vectors uh, to, this, to, to, this, to this black hyperplane. Uh, and it's, it's actually a pretty uh, powerful algorithm that you can use. Uh, it, it, is, it is basically one of the machine learning algorithms that we discuss. It is a supervised learning algorithm as well. And if I go to the next slide, talked about the ANN and the, the objective was to uh, minimize this cost function here, uh, which we talked about the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer, and the, the concept behind back propagation when you back propagate through the back to the hidden layer and, and basically change the, the like neurons and then uh, go through those iterations. And then grid search is basically used to find the, the optimum hyperparameters. So in grid search, it is ideal to uh, you know, each machine learning model, like for example, um, the ANN model, you, you can define what type of solvers to use. You can define what kind of activation function to use. You have to define what kind of, how many neurons to use, how many layers to use, right? Um, so so it, it, it can be pretty tedious to find the best um, hyperparameters within an ANN model or, or within any machine learning model. So that's why it is important to uh, use grid search to find, to run, it's basically a nested for loop that, that, that basically finds you the best hyperparameters that would result in the, in the highest accuracy. So uh, the, one of the disadvantages of grid search is that it takes a long time to run. So, um, you know, you can, if you have a large data set, it might take you days, if not weeks, uh, like for your computer to constantly run uh, to find the best hyper hyper tuning, you know, uh, like like the, like the best hyper parameters, but it is uh, it is pretty important to make sure the machine learning model that you build is a general machine learning model. You can apply it to a blind set and it does a good job. And uh, grid search helps you finding the the like the best hyper parameters for your model to make sure your model does not fail when it goes to production. So now we, I talked about all of this. You might say, Haas, what's the point of all of this? You know, this is all a lot of like, the, like theoretical stuff. Show me some value. Okay. So now you build a model. Now you can predict what is the impact of each parameter of each of your completions parameters in this case on your production output and find out you can then run economic analysis. You can do all kinds of stuff with it, right? So this is called a one variable at a time sensitivity. We call OBAT. Okay. And OBAT. And I use the support vector machine model. I also use the ANN model. The, 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 like the results are very similar after uh, fine uh, after fine tuning the hyperparameters. This basically shows what is the impact of increasing my cluster spacing on my EUR per thousand feet. Again, I removed the numbers just just for this in this case for confidentiality. But you can see here that as you increase your cluster spacing, you know your EUR per thousand feet goes down. But if you if, if you see here uh, going from here to here, the difference is not really much. 
So you can then run your economic analysis to see how much really, uh, which cluster spacing is actually the optimal cluster spacing as opposed to just choosing the lowest cluster spacing in this case. This is the number of clusters per stage. You can see the, the, the uh, it looks like right around here, uh, you have the optimal number of clusters per stage. And per foot, uh, there is no break breakover that was observed on a sand per foot. Um, so, so this is also pretty important to know that as you increase the amount of sand that you pump during hydraulic frac jobs in this particular field, uh, you're also increasing production. The sand to water ratio shows that as you increase the number of or the amount of sand to water ratio, which essentially means you're pumping more sand in relation to water, you're decreasing production performance, which means that you need to pump more water in relation to your sand in this case. And then finally, rate is the impact of rate on your EUR per thousand feet. And basically, that's all I've got. I just wanted to show you a case study.